Talk, where we talk to movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show <laughs> in the galaxy. My name is Mark, and I want to give a special thank you to all the Collider fans that saw me at the Houston Improv this weekend. And to those eighth graders I played basketball with on Saturday, Pass the ball once in a while. <laughs> and we should also mention that it's a great panel we have here today, but somebody who's not here is actually celebrating a birthday. Today is Mr. John Schnapp's Yay. birthday. Yay. Happy birthday. I believe he's 23 years old. Uh, uh -huh. Hi, Schnapp. Everybody go out there and uh, find him on Twitter and wish him a very happy birthday. Also here, Dennis Zen. Yeah, hit him up on Twitter and say that Collider sent you. Wish you a happy birthday. What, yeah, 23? 23, 23, 24, you, you, yeah. something like that. He's got that mid-20s, you know, yeah. angst Straight still going college, on. Straight out of college, you know. Yeah, he's finding his way. Also here, Clark Wolf. Hey, guys, thanks for having me. And happy birthday, John Schnepp. I love you. All right, enough about Schnepp. Now it's back to <laughs> us. It's all about us. We're talking <laughs> movies, and we have a lot of cool stories to get to. But as we usually like to kick off things here on Monday, Ashley, let's talk about what went down at the theaters this past yes, weekend. Yes, it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. The box office juggernaut that is Disney continues its dominating hold on the box office, with Captain America Civil War taking the number one spot with $72.6 million, snagging the record of the six highest grossing superhero movie of all time. Cap's latest record also helped Marvel cross $10 billion worldwide for their Marvel Cinematic Universe total. The Jungle Book took the number two spot with $17.8 million, crossing $800 million to bring the worldwide total to $828.1 million. Money Monster pulled in $15 million for the number three spot, with The Darkness taking in $5.2 million for the number four spot. And at number five, Mother's Day with $3.2 million. Mark, thoughts about about Captain America and Marvel breaking all sorts of box office records. Well, I mean, the $10 billion mark is always what everybody dreams of crossing in life. But, you know, they've had a lot of movies come out, too. So congratulations. <laughs> you crossed $10 billion. I can't even count that high. So I'm just looking at what happened this weekend, and that was Civil War, having a pretty nice second weekend with $72 million. And The Jungle Book is also, that movie came out April 15th, guys. And it's still, it just never had that huge drop-off that you usually expect to see with any movie from a second to third weekend or third to fourth weekend. It just keeps making money. Speaking of money, Money Monster is a movie that, look, you got huge stars in it. It's directed by Jodie Foster. It just feels like it didn't have a whole lot of critical acclaim that it maybe should have had if more people were going to go see it. And again, it's a summertime kind of feel, and you don't really want that with Money Monster. You know, if you're going to go see a movie in the summer, it's probably going to be a huge blockbuster or a comedy or a horror movie. Unless you're the darkness, which just, I mean, Clark, I want to ask you about the darkness, yeah. first of all, because I know you're a big horror movie mm -hmm. fan. Do movies like the darkness, which got panned by critics, mm -hmm. it wasn't even screened early, it only made $5 million. It seems to be just like an opening weekend kind of, hey, let's see what money we can get with the movie title called The Darkness. Does that hurt horror movies in the long run? Um, You know, I don't think so. I think what hurts horror movies in the long run are the big swings. Like, so something like Deliver Us From Evil, sure, right, yeah. with uh, Eric Bana that mm -hmm. came out a few July's ago, it was a big release date and it was a big movie, expensive movie, and boy, it just sucked. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, to be, but it was not good and um, and it wasn't well received. But something like The Darkness, you know, we talked about it a little bit on last week's show. This is a Blumhouse tilt release. Mm -hmm. They didn't throw their whole weight behind it. This was basically one of those things where, hey, it's gonna go out into theaters for a little while, but it's mostly gonna live online. So, you know, and look, for five, honestly, Five million dollars, not a big box office haul. But for me, I'm looking at those numbers and I'm going, wow, yeah, Kevin Bacon's in it, but they didn't really do press for it. It's a small release. It didn't have a ton of marketing and it still made five million dollars. To me, that's the hardcore horror audience showing up that you can rely on. Right. Well, something that the studios definitely did throw their weight behind would be Captain America's Civil War. And so for the second weekend, Dennis, this thing, I we, we expected it to be number one again. Uh, what does this number indicate to you? Well, before I get to that, I want to ask Clark something because Clark teaches me all these things when I come to when she comes on movie talk. She teaches me about statement necklaces. <laughs> uh, what is this gel manicure? Gel manicures. manicures. Yep, so yep. I'd like to ask you, as, as someone who's not a horror fan, what does Blumhouse tilt mean? What do you mean oh, by that? Yes. So Blumhouse tilt is a um, so Blumhouse has a big production deal with Universal. Okay. So what that means is they take movies that they're particularly you know um, enthusiastic about to Universal first. 
and they get the option to distribute them, you know, in a big in a big way, right? right? So something like the purge is universal. That comes from Blumhouse. Um, but when you have Blumhouse tilt, you know, basically Blumhouse's production model is super low budgets. Uh, a lot of times they get big stars, hoping that if the movie goes big, those big stars will get a percentage of the return, yeah. right? They make so many movies that they have this um, this excess of films, and sometimes they sit on the shelf for a very very long time. Sometimes, and and so tilt. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, downplay it and and sort of seem like I'm I'm teasing it, but um, it's kind of a dumping ground. Mm -hmm. it, that's at least that's how it's known. The, so, the name indicates that they're drunk somehow. <laughs> so <laughs> they might have been drunk yeah. when they were greenlighting these movies. I don't know, but but basically it is their direct. With you know, all kidding aside, it is their direct to digital platform. So but that's what Blumhouse or BH Tilt means. Yeah, well, again, and if you can be out in the theater for a few weeks and make maybe ten million bucks. Get Kevin Bacon's name back in the populace, yep. if even for a weekend, then I guess it did its job. I'm really bummed out by Zootopia because it couldn't make 300,000 more dollars and knock Mother's Day out of the top five. <laughs> Nobody wants to see that movie in the top five anymore. Mother's Day was a week ago, and even if you took your mom to see Mother's Day, you're a bad kid because you should not treat anybody to see that movie. You should be going to see Captain America Civil War. My question to you kids is do you think that Civil War can maintain number one for yet another weekend in a row, or do you think something like either Neighbors 2, or Angry Birds is going to unseat it. I don't think it. I think it's going to be number one again. I, I, I did want to talk about it. I mean, obviously, $70 million is nothing to sneeze at, but I think it might be a little disappointing. I think I, I was thinking it was going to get closer to like 80-something, the drop-off, not huge like Batman v Superman, but it was much more than, than I expected. And, it, and we talked about this last week about... Batman v Superman maybe have affecting Civil War maybe because of the mixed reactions maybe now seeing this and the drop off even with the good word of mouth the good critics reviews there was still more of a drop off than I expected so maybe there is some sort of superhero fatigue setting in that that it's regardless of, of quality of the movie or even the the fan or critic reaction because now that I'm looking, I'm thinking maybe if Civil War had come out before Batman v Superman, Batman v Superman came out, they would have been hurt by Civil War just by being so close together. Now we have X-Men Apocalypse coming pretty soon, and that, I, I have a feeling, is going to be really hurt by now two big superhero movies coming out before that. I mean, it was a 60% slide from yeah. week one to week two for Civil War. Clark, do you also see a superhero fatigue setting in a little bit? Well, I don't know. In the case of Civil War, I'm actually wondering if the fact that the movie started screening so far before its release date and being released all around the world before it opened here, I'm wondering if that had something to do with it. I don't know, but I, I feel like the buzz that was generated for Civil War when critics got to start or start Started watching it was was a month ago I mean I've been hearing about this movie in fact wasn't the premiere the same week Jungle Book came out it was like I think it was the week before Jungle Book came I out because I was on the road and I missed it and everybody else got to go see so it. I mean that's I don't know if that's you know if that has a direct impact but I wonder if it has some sort of impact and also I think that a 60% drop is not is not horrible um, I don't know if it's overall superhero fatigue or if it's the idea that this is an intense movie. You know what I mean? Like when I think about fun summer block, but don't get me wrong, I loved I loved Civil War. I thought it was a great film. But if I if I had one sort of critique of it, it was a little slow for me at some points. It's a serious movie. There's a lot at stake. So Maybe that's what the audiences are responding to. I mean, either way, I think X-Men Apocalypse really has their hands full because I, I know it's different studios and all that stuff, but just as a fan, when you're watching TV and you see all these ads come on, it's like, okay, another superhero, a lot of mutants fighting each other. It just it feels a little redundant when you get this many movies coming out that seem to have the same premise, right, Dennis? And, that, and, and I think it is the time, and I think it's not so much that there's too many superhero movies, it's that they're starting to get clustered together mm -hmm. in the release dates. Right. Like if you had spread these movies out, I think they would have done, each one of them would have probably have done better. Well, they tried to also. I mean, Batman v Superman is a summer movie that came out at the end of March. So like they're doing the best they can with this, but it just seems like we've seen this movie before and I think it might hurt X-Men Apocalypse. And let's not, this weekend is gonna be dedicated to comedy though, because mm -hmm. you have the nice guys also coming out. Then Angry Birds, more for the kids, but it's an animated 
good movie, could do big numbers, and obviously Neighbors 2 is now a franchise, and the first one I thought was hysterical. I'm really looking forward to Neighbors 2, so a lot of exciting stuff this week as well. Ashley, what's our next story? The Black Panther movie got a massive boost of hype when Chadwick Boseman's turn as the Wakanda warrior turned out to be one of the best parts of Marvel's Captain America Civil War. Marvel then continued to build the anticipation when Oscar winner Lupita Nyong'o entered talks to join the cast. Now things have hit a fever pitch of excitement for the fans, with THR reporting that director Ryan Coogler will officially re-team again with his Creed and Fruitvale Station star Michael B. Jordan. Jordan, who has joined the cast of Black Panther in an unknown role, speculated to be the movie's villain. Filming is expected to begin soon with director Ryan Coogler also writing a draft of the script. Casting will also continue with a recent interview with Kevin Feige saying the cast of Black Panther will be 90% African and African American. Black Panther will hit theaters July 6, 2018. Dennis, thoughts on Michael B. Jordan joining the cast of Black Panther? Well, not a big surprise. I mean, with Ryan Coogler heading up the film and having worked with him with Fruitville Station and Creed, it, it wasn't unexpected, but I I, I, I like this a lot. I, I'm a big fan of Michael B. Jordan. I like what Ryan Coogler does with him. The question now is what character is he going to play? People are speculating that maybe a villain. I just don't want to see his character come and go. Mm. I, I, with an with actor like Michael B. Jordan, I hope it's a role that he'll be able to play further down the line. He doesn't come in as a villain and get killed right away. People are speculating maybe uh, there's a character named White Wolf, which is uh, basically the adopted brother of Black Panther that he could play. So I I'm all for it. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be up for that. It seems like Michael B. Jordan is like the De Niro or DiCaprio to Coogler's Martin Scorsese's. If that's his muse, then he picked a really good one. And it's awesome to see Michael B. Jordan, who was in the train wreck known as Fantastic Four, <laughs> now get already another shot at a superhero franchise, this time in a much better home, that being Marvel. And whatever role he's playing in Black Panther, I'm just excited to see Town. I like when Town is involved in movies movies that I get excited about. So whether he's playing a villain, whether it is something like Loki, where you see him as a repeat presence in a Black Panther franchise, or even if it is a situation like Darth Maul, where it's just like a really cool, intriguing villain and then beep, gets cut in half, I'd be up for it either way. Whatever story this movie wants to tell me, I'm on board, and I'm even more so now that Michael B. Jordan's a part of it. Yeah, I am too. I mean, I, I think this is a great collection of talent so far, and I think it's only going to get better. And um, I, I think to your point, Mark, about Fantastic Four, I think this is probably very telling about that franchise like <laughs> look I mean not to say that we all were holding our breaths for another Fantastic Four movie uh, in the vein of what we had already seen but and I don't know the inner workings of their deals I'm not their lawyer but this tells me that contractually perhaps Michael B. Jordan is not exclusive to the Fox Fantastic Four universe anymore I don't even think Tilt wants to touch <laughs> Fantastic Four too. yeah it's not coming out on Blumhouse Tilt either <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah I think I think that this is this is really telling but i think it's also really exciting so it's great absolutely we love hearing from you guys too so whether you're live with us on the chat board right now or commenting on youtube afterwards let us know your thoughts on all these stories particularly do you like michael b jordan being in another ryan coogler film that being black panther what's up next ash Deadline is reporting that Gareth Edwards has exited Godzilla 2 and is split reported to be amicable for both Edwards and Warner Brothers. Edwards, who helmed the first film in the series in 2014, promptly signed on to direct Rogue One, a Star Wars story, which will release later this December. Edwards has his own project in various forms of development he wants to pursue, which Deadline reports is smaller in scale than the back-to-back tentpole sized pictures he's directed with Godzilla and then Star Wars. Max Borenstein wrote the current version of Godzilla 2, which was dated last week for release on March 22, 2019. It is said that Edwards and Legendary agreed to him stepping away before the picture's date was set. Legendary and Warner Brothers are now looking for a director to replace Edwards as they also work on Godzilla vs. Kong, which has been set for release on May 20th, 2020. Clark, thoughts on losing Gareth Edwards for Godzilla 2? Well, I mean, look, you know, Godzilla got him Rogue One, I would argue, and um, and so I suppose it served its purpose. Um, I am not a fan of anything I've ever seen Gareth Edwards direct. I really did not like Monsters, and I really did not like Godzilla. <gasps> no! Yes! <laughs> I, I really don't like either of these. Underline really like a thousand times. <laughs> um, and in fact, you know, his involvement in Rogue One, maybe Rogue One will be the one that turns me. Maybe. I hope so. Um, because, you know, lots of people seem to think that he does a good job with what he, whatever, enough to be hired 
uh, many times over. So, um, so yeah, this this is actually good news for somebody like me who wanted something different from the Godzilla uh, reboot, and um, and I'm, I'm hoping for something different from Godzilla too. Um, so, so I I actually like this news. Well, it's a rebellion, and I rebel because <laughs> I actually really, really, really liked the first Godzilla movie. So I'm bummed to hear Gareth Edwards isn't doing it, but I totally understand it. And look, the move it's not like this movie's coming out next year. You know, this isn't even like an Ant Man situation where we're ready to go and oh my god we don't have a director anymore this thing's coming out in 2019 i mean just reading that i'm like god i gotta wait three more years to see godzilla back on the big screen but then what if i can make it to 2019 alive and in one piece that means i only have one more year before kong versus <laughs> godzilla the fight i've wanted to see since i was a kid again in the theater that's going to be amazing dennis and i don't think losing gareth edwards hurts godzilla 2 necessarily even though i did love what he did with the first one very excited about rogue one i understand that these are huge huge movies and that you don't always want to make those kind of movies if you have smaller projects that you'd rather work on i think this is fine it's not terrible news in my book how about you yeah unlike clark i actually like gareth edwards I, I didn't love godzilla but I, I enjoyed it enough in monsters i thought for what it was w was fine but i i do think him leaving this project isn't necessarily heartbreaking to me I, i'm not like oh man like I, I wish he had stayed on plus you know after star wars comes out and rogue one comes out he's going to be able to do a lot of stuff i mean I, i'm just assuming it's going to do very well and it'll be well received he's going to have a lot of options on the table it sounds like he wants to do some pro projects his own probably original concepts also he's part of the disney family now maybe he's going to work on other star wars films or maybe even move over to marvel and handle some of those we don't know but 2019 that's so far away i mean they, they could they could possibly move up the date if they wanted to because they were waiting for him they're waiting for him to finish up with rogue one so that he could work on godzilla maybe they'll find a director soon and be like all right Let's let's start out work on it now. And we'll move move that release date. Up. Well, hey, we're nothing if not speculators. So do you guys have a director in mind that you would like to see step in to the Godzilla 2 forefront? I mean, this is a really easy answer. It's a very easy answer. But Guillermo, I, I mean, Guillermo really? del Toro. Okay. Yeah, I would love to. Or if not for Godzilla 2, maybe Godzilla Kong versus Godzilla. Versus and Pacific Rim. Yes. 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 I mean, you know. Then they'll be as excited as you are <laughs> about yeah, Kong versus Godzilla. I mean, you know. It's a possibility. It's all. It's all under the same in the same house. Well, hey, look. If you get Kong and you get Godzilla, why not throw some Jaeger in there? Jaeger always makes things better. <laughs> and with Kaija, it just adds that much more excitement. Dennis, how about you? Anybody on your short list right now for Godzilla too? Oh man, I don't know. I mean, besides Guillermo del Toro, man. I mean, maybe P Peter Jackson, maybe he could come back and do another big... I, like King Kong, I, I like the movie. He just needed to cut off. The project was reportedly initiated by Clooney, Soderbergh, and late producer Jerry Weintraub, with Olivia Milch set to pen the screenplay. The tracking board also reports that the project won't be a hard reboot, but a spinoff of the Clooney-led trilogy, with Bullock in the role of Danny Ocean's sister, leading a team of thieves <laughs> to steal a necklace from the Met Ball and frame a crooked gallery owner. No release date has been set mark byers sell jennifer lawrence in an oceans 11 spin-off movie with sandra bullock i mean yeah i'll i'll buy jennifer lawrence being in it i i'll buy anything that has jennifer lawrence even though i wasn't overwhelmed by her performance in x-men apocalypse i think she totally mailed that movie in but when you guys see it you can let us know do you think that she's kind of licking the stamp and putting it on the envelope just a little bit in x-men where she feels like she wants to get out of that role once and for all i understand putting on that blue stuff every day i don't even know if she puts on blue stuff or just like a like, like a suit and then they they see giant later it looks like a lot of work to play that role this movie I just I don't love the fact that it's Danny Ocean's sister like yeah. we have to make it set in that universe somehow I Danny Ocean did he ever reference having a sister in any of the oceans 11 or 12 or 13s or it, that seems a little hokey to me but Sandra Bullock and Jennifer Lawrence. Oceans label onto it. The idea that she's Danny's sister opens the door for George Clooney to make a cameo, for him to be involved in the movie in front yeah. of the camera and behind the camera. So if we have to slap the Oceans label on, I'm okay with that. Um, in terms of Jennifer Lawrence, I suppose that makes real good sense, considering she's the biggest movie star, one of the biggest movie stars in the world. She's young, um, she's an Oscar winner. So, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm just not overly thrilled about Jennifer Lawrence in general. It's not that I don't like her, it's just 
when I think about a draw, she's not really it. But then again, she's got a really quirky, kind of cute, fun personality. And we haven't, I don't think we've really seen that uh, screwball side of her that we know in real life if you watch any interview with her mm-hmm. on screen. So this could be a great way for her and Sandra Bullock to play off of each other. So I'm definitely intrigued. And you guys know Sandra Bullock's my girl. So <laughs> I, I I will show up for anything that she's involved in. Okay, Dennis, we got Katniss Everdeen. She's with Sandra Bullock and she's stealing stuff. Do you like it? Well, it's very rare, but you and me are actually on the same page on this no, one. All right, me and Denny. Uh, yeah, I, I'll buy it as long as she... <laughs> Puts in more effort than she did with X-Men Apocalypse. I mean, she really mailed that one in. Yeah, kind of is. Like, she had, like... In, in this situation, the reason why I'll buy it is I have a feeling that is this is a project that she's probably more interested in actually doing versus X-Men, where it's it's more like, okay, she was kind of more forced into doing it. And, and I think it's fun. But I'm also with you with the whole Sandra Book being Danny Ocean's sister. Why? I th- the only reason I think they want to do that is so they can have maybe some cameos. Maybe George Clooney pops up or some of the other cast members. But other than that, why, why not just make it some other, you know, con person? Yeah, or you con- know, when, when Clark brought up that premise of maybe you could see a Clooney or a Brad Pitt or a Don Cheadle in there, I'm like, yeah, that'd be kind of neat. But I still, like, I know it was very controversial when they rebooted Ghostbusters and they have a different cast and it's in a new universe, but I thought it was the right play. It's like, I, I don't necessarily think that it, it helps this heist chances when you have three other massive heists that went down in the same universe. So I think you should just start from scratch. Well, the other thing I wanted to mention is one of the things that I think is always kind of fun and a little cheeky about the Oceans franchise is that they're very self-referential, right? Sure. So like Julia Roberts playing Julia Roberts for a minute or whatever, they they have fun with the fact that they know they have an ensemble of huge movie stars who are laughing at themselves, having a little bit of a good time. So I think that with uh, something tells me that with something like this they are very aware of of the um the the uh speculation or feelings or sentiment around really like another one of these and so i wonder if we will if they will have a little fun with that concept as well well it's a predominantly female cast and so i'm going to take the time now to ask our females on the show today clark and ashley have you guys ever stolen anything and if so do you want to come clean oh my gosh you can just say yes you can say no you don't have to get in specifics have you ever stolen something i've never i really no i've never stolen anything you steal hearts Uh, (laughs) but you guys i have to say like jennifer lawrence i can't imagine her taking the back seat to, I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see them together, but like, I can't imagine her being the right hand man or something like that. Like the Brad Pitt character for Ocean's yeah, I Eleven. Yeah, I mean, did you guys see that she tripped again at the X Men Apocalypse premiere? It's I like, girl, stop it. trying to like get all the attention. <laughs> we get it. Just take the freaking backseat. I don't know if she'll be able to take the backseat. She's more of a show stealer, I think, at least. I just uh, heels are hard to wear, man. It looks really hard. What you guys have to go through on a daily basis wearing heels. It looks. I would be tri- Dennis and I would be tripping all the time if we had to wear heels. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, but then we could wear statement necklaces. So to ma- then to it's show, all good, to right? Include your heels. I wonder if they'll be stealing a statement necklace. They uh, said they're stealing a necklace. If it's a statement necklace. It's got it, dude. If they're stealing a necklace, it's, and it's gonna in make some, a yeah, statement. It's gonna be a big statement, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So look for that. And now let's move on to our next topic. Right. On the heels of the can premiere of Steven Spielberg's The BFG, Disney has released a new trailer and poster to capitalize on the buzz coming out of the prestigious film festival. The movie, directed by Spielberg and written by his ET screenwriter, Melissa Matheson, has the general consensus saying that The BFG is a big, beautiful picture with Spielberg's signature heart. The movie stars Oscar winner Mark Rylance as the big friendly giant along with Ruby Barnhall, Bill Hader, Jemaine Clement, and Penelope Wilton. The BFG will play at the Sydney Film Festival this June before beginning its international rollout on June 30th, opening this U.S opening in the U.S. on July 1st. Dennis Byers sell the new trailer and poster for the BFG. I'm going to buy the poster, which, by the way, that's not the poster, but I'm going to sell the trailer. I mean, I'm not that interested in this movie, and if it wasn't Spielberg directing it, I don't think I would go see it. 
And then within the trailer, it, the trailer was fine, but you could tell there was, needs to be a lot of visual effects work that still needs to be done because a lot of the compositing and green screen, it just literally looks like the girl is there. And it's like, okay, here's the green screen. It doesn't come out to July, so I, I'm sure by that time they will have fixed it. But for right now, that's the, the thing I noticed the most in the trailer. You know, I did notice that as well. I'm still going to buy the trailer and the poster simply because, look, I believe in Spielberg. I believe in him as a storyteller, and that's what this trailer hooked me on is it's going to be a really fun story. I love Mark Rylance. The way that the giant looks, I think, is a really cool look for a huge creature. So I'm going to buy it. I did like the poster more than the trailer. We got a little bit more of the story. We got to see that it's, it's you know, he's kind of like a rogue giant, whereas all the other giants seem like bullies, and then he's the good one. I love the, him chopping the, the tree or whatever that thing was, like the trunk. I love the sound design in that. So everything about that scene, I loved, and he's, like, joking around with her that he's going to eat her, that he's not going to eat her. I thought that was cool. Cool. thought that was heartwarming. How about you, Clark? Yeah, I'm going to buy it. Um, I loved this book when I was a kid. And um, it's funny, we were talking before we started shooting about Mark Rylance and how he looks. And I think it was, was it, maybe it was Riley who said, like, somebody said, it just looks like Mark Rylance, but a giant. And, right. Uh, <laughs> but whoever it was, you know, what's interesting is that he, that's actually how he looks on the BFG, like how he was drawn in the original books. But anyway, um, I do buy it. I'm curious about the idea you know, the big buzz out of Cannes has been that this is like a return to old school Steven Spielberg, right? It feels like one of those childlike fantasies that we used to know him much more for. Um, and, you know, the the one thing that I think is disorienting for me is, is that it's so heavily computer generated, computer animated. And that's what's taking me out of it a little bit. Because I know Steven Spielberg movies when they were practical and when they were, you know, I don't know, had were a little more tangible. So the buzz out of the can out of can has been great. Um, I tend to believe that. And, you know, I, I'm excited about it. I do have high hopes for it. So I buy it. I mean, I don't think you need to go back to his like classic movie making like E.T. and stuff like that. You can just go back to the adventures of 1010, which I thought was a criminally underrated movie. I thought it was a really fun adventure. And I was I was in the green room last night, right before the show. And they didn't have HBO. So I tried to watch Game of Thrones. They didn't have Game of Thrones in there. So I had to go to something else. And Hook was on. And I have been on this show multiple times saying I just didn't like Hook as a kid. I never got into it, kind of hated it. I watched it last night and I gave it another shot and I kind of liked Hook a lot. I kind of got wrapped up in a damn world of imagination. So are you guys both Hook fans? I'm like a man. Uh, that's all right. But to clarify, that was a green room, not for this show. We don't have a we don't have the budget for a green room here. The, the no, green the, room for somewhere else. The green room is my office. Yeah. There, where there's just a lot of green T-shirts strewn about. Okay, Ashley, what's our last buy or sell topic? Variety is reporting that Goosebumps director Rob Letterman is on board to direct a reboot of Dungeons and Dragons for Warner Brothers Studios. Sources at Variety say that a recent presentation to execs from Letterman helped secure him the job. The film will mark the second go around for the project following the 2001 version which underwhelmed at the box office. The film has been in development for some time now with a lawsuit between Sweet Pea Entertainment and Hasbro about ownership of the sequel rights delaying the progress. Once the settlement was finalized last August, the studio announced pre-production as moving forward. No release date has been set yet. Clark Byers sell a Dungeons and Dragons movie with Rob Letterman directing. Well, I think that I think I'm going to sell it because uh, I think it's confusing, you know, Letterman is best known for mostly children's movies and um, so the question becomes okay is this going to be a version for mainly aimed at kids um, and if so that is a very different game or um, film uh, than the game necessary you know and um, and so I don't know my big question is is Marlon Wayans coming back for this? <laughs> I mean because that's the big that's the most important thing that we need to get to the bottom of I mean yeah I, I would definitely want Marlon Wayans and Jeremy Irons to reprise their roles <laughs> in this new Dungeons and Dragons. I'm with you, Clark. I'm going to sell this too, simply because I haven't seen enough of a track record from Rob Letterman, who did Gulliver's Travels on top of Goosebumps. And it's like, I, those movies, I didn't hate them, but I didn't love them either. And nothing that I saw in those movies makes me think that he's going to be able to bring Dungeons and Dragons to life, which is a malign property when you're talking about making a movie. Like the 2001 is a train wreck of a film, and it just didn't, it failed to get a new audience in there. And the hardcore D&D &D fans that were so excited to see that movie 
most of them left very let down. So it's a tall order to make a Dungeons and Dragons movie that I think a lot of people start out playing when they're kids. So I can see that perspective of it, but then you get older and you really take that stuff seriously and you hold it close to your heart. So it's a tough thing to do. And I don't know as of right now that I've seen enough from Rob Letterman to think that he's the guy. How about you, Dennis? Yeah, I'm going to tentatively sell it as well because I haven't watched Goosebumps, Gulliver's Travels. What else did he do? Uh, Shark Tank. Shark Tale, or maybe. Shark, I Shark Tank sounds like an <laughs> awesome movie. Monsters versus Aliens. And, and I'm with Clark where this indicates if, if they're hiring him, they with his track record, that means they may be going in a direction that's more kid-friendly with Dungeons and Dragons, which I'm disappointed by because I thought they were going to go more Lord of the Rings, get a little more, not so much like adult, but at least get a like a PG-13 rating. This sounds more like, hey, let's get a make a kid fun film PG rated. So I, I, don't, I don't like this at all. Well, look, I mean, if you know anything about me, despite what Ashley had to say when I came into the office this morning, I try to put a positive spin on everything. I try to be in a good mood. So how about this? Maybe Rob Letterman made a pitch and was like, look, I know you guys need a director for D&D. I'm a huge D&D fan. Maybe he grew up and he loves Dungeons and Dragons and that's the property that he's always wanted to make so now he has the platform to do it that could be the case i don't know if rob letterman has ever rolled a dice in his life i'm just saying that might be one of the reasons why he would be a director well side note uh the director of the 2001 version of DD was a huge D &D oh, fan. oh god no and that's part of the reason why he got that job in the first place is because he was a huge fan of the game and we saw how that turned out. So I hope that that's not the case. Or if it is, I hope he's got a good... Because, it, look, the, the, uh, the piece did mention that his pitch was what, you know, won him the mm -hmm. job. And so maybe maybe he really has a, a cohesive and smart take on this material. Well, hopefully he also doesn't get Space Jam. Like, the, the director of the original Space Jam had said, basically, Space Jam 2 is going to be doomed and fa going to fail. <laughs> hopefully he doesn't get that from the previous director. I, I just love the term Space Jam. Jam. Yeah, <laughs> we got to We got to start using that yeah. more often. That's going to be my new phenomenal is Space Jam. Yeah. That's a great term. You know what? To celebrate Space Jam and Dennis's new phrase, Ashley, let's celebrate with one more buy or sell. Oh, there we go. Though he's been rumored for some time now as joining Hugh Jackman in his last go around as Wolverine, Patrick Stewart's Professor X had yet to be confirmed as officially joining the project. But thanks to an interview with producer Hutch Parker, Collider's own Steve Frosty Weintraub was able to finally confirm that Stewart will be joining the ensemble, rumored to be a story loosely based on the old man Logan storyline from the comics. Stewart then confirmed that the news as well on Twitter, tweeting, worst kept secret shortly after Parker's statements were made public. As Jack Jackman previously teased, the idea will be to explore the father-son dynamic of the Wolverine slash Professor X relationship with the Wolverine helmer James Mangold directing. The untitled Wolverine picture is slated for release on March 3rd, 2017. Mark Byers saw Patrick Stewart officially in Wolverine 3. Well, I'm thrilled that Patrick Stewart is not being space jammed by James McAvoy, and he gets to be back as Professor X. I totally buy this news. It's right. It was the worst kept secret, but it's fun that it's official now, and we can talk about and speculate a little bit because that father-son dynamic is what you want to see from this old man Logan. If that's the storyline they're going with, then it makes sense to have Patrick Stewart be the predominant Professor X in here. Now, we know that x-men movies or even wolverine movies they can play with time a little bit so you might see both incarnations of professor x in there but i think that this means that patrick stewart is going to have the meteor role when it comes to that bald psychic guy so dennis are you thrilled about this like i am yeah i buy it i love patrick stewart loved him as john luke picard love him as professor x uh also with, with the if it is going to be the old man Logan storyline, which it looks like it's going to be. They talk about it. it's going to be rated R. It's going to be set in the future. It's going to have a Western vibe to it, which indicates more post-apocalyptic thing. The way that studios now are doing it, especially like we saw Days of Future Past, we just watched Civil War, they take the story, the concept, the spirit of a story, comic book storyline, and then they update it and change it. And I think that's the case with this one because Professor X isn't in the old man Logan comic book storyline, but somehow they're going to fit him in and they're going to change. And there's a lot of things that they can't do. There's no Hulk. There's no Red Skull. There's a lot of characters they, they don't have access to. So they definitely are trying to do something with the same vibe as the comic book storyline, but definitely veered off into a different path. Clark, all of a sudden, we're like 10 months away from actually getting to see this movie, yeah. so do you buy or sell this news? Yeah, I do buy it. I buy it because I think it's great that Patrick Stewart's going to be there for Hugh Jackman's last turn as Wolverine. I think that's important um, to the fans and to the storytelling. Um, I, you know, 
because I have not really enjoyed the first two Wolverine movies, um, I'm I'm just skeptical of all of this, a bit skeptical of all of this in general. Um, but I like I like the direction that everything sounds like it's heading, and I hope that it's his final as for his final bow as Wolverine. It's um it it pays it. It's an, a fitting tribute, a fitting way to go out. That's what I'm hoping. Well, it seems to be a conversation that comes up a lot around these parts, and particularly when we were doing our Deadpool commentary last week, that whether a movie needs to be rated R or not. So do you think that the rated R Wolverine might be able to tell the story in a way that's more conducive to you enjoying it? I, I do. I do. I think that that, I mean, not to say, the reason that I didn't enjoy the first two was not because they weren't rated R, but I do think that that could definitely um, help tell the story. And also, look, I think they really care about Hugh Jackman, and I think you know meaning the people who make this franchise i think that they want to um i really think they want to do right by him and if this is the final one as they keep saying it is which i tend to believe then yeah let's pull out all the stops let's go for it let's let wolverine be violent let's let them curse let's let all of this stuff happen let's take out the claws and let's, let's see some do blood. It. well speaking of claws and blood let's go back to the chat board <laughs> wendy so we had a lot of buy ourselves we had wolverine we had a DD &D movie we had jennifer lawrence joining sandra bullock and the bfg trailer what's everybody talking about Rare. Um, all right, well, let's go all the way back to Ocean's Eleven. While a few doesn't mind this version of Ocean's Eleven, the majority is a sell, a lot of sell, and it seems like the chat's just had enough of Jennifer Lawrence. For BFG, not a lot of people are excited about this movie. Those who are planning to see it, it's mostly because they have to take their kids because they've read the book or are reading the book right now. For the Dungeons & Dragons story, uh, some are saying that it could be a good film, but there is a lot of sell. sell. Um, Elpin Newt Plays Game says, I'd rather see a Warhammer or Warhammer 40K movie, and D&D &D equals LARPing the movie. <laughs> and finally, for the Wolverine story, bye. Bye all over the place for Patrick Stewart coming back for Professor X. Well, that's nice. I hope you're watching, Patrick. We love you and your huge, beautiful, bald head. I mean, look, I would rather see a Magic the Gathering movie than Dungeons & Dragons, but if it's going to be directed by somebody, I want them to care about MTG and all that stuff. You have to grow up playing it in order to really get the storytelling aspect of it. That's enough for me. Okay, Ashley, let's move on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where we get to hear from you guys. You guys, write us in your emails at collidervideo at gmail.com and Ashley's going to read a few right now. We're also going to save some time at the end of this show for your live Twitter questions. If you want to tweet us, get your tweet read on air, simply do so at Collider video okay ash what's up first in our mailbox sean schiffinger writes hi guys i was wondering about studio interference interference we always hear about the horror stories i.e fantastic four and batman versus superman <laughs> but are there any times you can think of where studio interference has helped make a movie better thanks i don't think there was enough studio interference on batman v superman <laughs> to be honest with you i mean look i i think that a lot of times obviously studios get the bad rap because oh they're the fat cats and they're mm. just counting money but a lot of times studio interference does help movies it's just we just don't hear about it you know when somebody has a great idea to make something and either it's not feasible or they're just going in the wrong direction like sometimes you can get way too absorbed in the source material or whatever you're making and you can't step back and have that perspective to say well is this going to make sense to an audience like i know for example when the wachowskis were making the first matrix movie they had like such a deep and intricate way that the neurological pathways worked and all these things and the studio came in and said look guys you need to make this a little more digestible for a mass audience and I think that's why the Matrix the first one works so well and then the second and third one when the Wachowskis could do whatever the hell they wanted mm -hmm. to they got a little more confusing and intricate not in a way that benefited any viewer at least not me Dennis can you think of any times in history when studio interference has actually been a benefit uh, I, I yeah we do tend to like freak out when we hear about studio interference but I think there's two areas where where it might be more helpful one is in pre-production during the script process when they're when they're developing the story and Maybe there's certain things they, they want or don't want. And then in the post-production pro process after the, the movie is filmed, they can take a look at it maybe with a better eye than the director who is totally invested and they want, you know, they want to kill their babies. They, they want to have everything they, they shot in there. And we could be more helpful. The, I think the, the problem of studio interference is when it starts to mess into the production process because mm -hmm. you don't really know what you got yet during the production process. And so when you start messing with that, I think that tends to be more of a problem. Uh, one movie that uh, I think benefited from a little studio inf interference in the post-production process was uh, James Cameron's Aliens. I, I love it. It's one of my top action movies of all time. If you've watched the special edition, you'll see all these extra scenes that they that he wanted to include that the studio cut out, and, and they cut it out for good reason. They weren't bad scenes. They just 
they just uh, interfered with the pace of the movie. There was a, a scene with Ripley finding out about her daughter. Newt and her family had a, a scene. There was a sentry gun sequence as well. Where it was just guns in a hallway shooting down aliens. It was cool, but it, it kind of interrupted the flow of the movie. So that that's one for me. I just say get Newt out of there, man. I just want to see Sigourney Weaver shoot a bunch of aliens. <laughs> I don't need any little kids running around outer space. How about you, Clark? Can you ever think of a time in history when studio interference has actually helped? Well, I, I don't know, but the thing that I kind of sprung to mind was actually um actually ant-man so from and you know not that that was studio interference but clearly you know um edgar wright left the project because he and the studio were not seeing eye to eye and you know we as fans heard a lot about that and that was a huge thing but what i the thing that i remember thinking when i left ant-man was all that movie had to be was fine, considering all of the production problems that we had heard. And I thought it was great. I mean, I love Ant-Man. I just love that movie. I think it I think it holds up from the first time that I saw it. So that was a movie that was not, um, you know, uh, drowned in, in the production problems. That's a great point. I mean, when you look at a studio like Marvel or Pixar, where it is a collective of ideas, but they really do share information. And if, if it's not building on the universe that they already created, they're not gonna be able to make that movie. I think I think that was the situation with Edgar Wright. Uh, a couple other examples real quick is that I know that Lethal Weapon, the first one, I don't know if it was Joel Silver, somebody else on the studio side stepped in and said, we need to make this, we need to make the ending feel more like a setup for more movies mm -hmm. because they so strongly believed in the chemistry between Mel Gibson and Danny Glover that they knew they could make a franchise out of it. And also The Wizard of Oz, the studio stepped in on The Wizard of Oz and said that we think we need to make this a dream <laughs> sequence because we don't believe that audiences are gonna think that Oz is a place on earth. So you had to make it some other ethereal plane. A little nugget of information for you guys. The studio also wanted to cut over the rainbow from uh, Wizard of Oz. What? Cut that number. <laughs> <laughs> Fat shows, shows them. But actually, I real fast, can we go back to this question? Uh, because they, the person who wrote it mentions Batman v Superman, but I don't remember hearing studio interference on in Batman the, in the post v process. Superman. Okay. So Maybe because they cut I, down the yeah, movie. Yeah, they cut down oh, the oh, movie. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, I would be curious to visit this question again after Suicide Squad, after we have been hearing of more mm -hmm. hands-on um, notes or direct and direct, you know. Well, specifically for Batman v Super, I'm interested in revisiting after we watch the, the director, director's yeah. cut. I mean, if it's a good 30 minutes. And then there was rumors that... that it was actually even longer than that, the original cut, like maybe four hours or something like that. Boy, buckle yeah. in for that collider commentary. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely going to happen. The day that Blu-ray comes out, we're very excited to do it. That's going to be a two-pee break kind of day, but it's going to be worth it because we can't wait to see what we didn't get to see in theaters. All right, Ash, what's up next? Joshua Tuning writes, Hey, Collider crew, now that Comic-Con approaches and with all the amazing comic book movies to come this year and next, which movie trailer or event do you expect to steal Comic-Con? My guess is Dr. Strange or Wonder Woman thoughts I love 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 this question because it's so fun to be there in Hall H and see a trailer just completely blow the 6,000 people that are lucky enough to waited in line all day and all night before to get in there and just be overwhelmed by awesomeness I don't know that that's going to happen in Hall H this year because a number of studios are not going to air new trailers or new footage during Hall H simply because they're nervous that it's going to get leaked out. They don't trust the security process at San Diego Comic-Con like they used to. I think the other reason is that there's just not the same kind of movies coming out where you had a Deadpool or you had a Batman v Superman. I think that if there is going to be a trailer or footage that wows everybody in Hall H, it would be Wonder Woman. I don't. Th I just don't think Doctor Strange. I think it's going to be great. I just don't think it's that kind of movie that everybody's going to leave that, that it necessarily gets people buzzing about it. You could see some awesome stuff from Benedict Cumberbatch, and I think you will. But I think Wonder Woman is going to be the one that surprises everybody. You're going to see some of the footage from that movie for the very first time, and people are going to go ape. How about you, Clark? Yeah, I agree. And actually, I do think that it's going to be really important for Warner Brothers to knock everybody's socks off mm -hmm. with this Wonder Woman footage because uh, this will this will go because uh, um, Suicide Squad's August, yeah? yeah. It'll come out like a couple weeks exactly. after. Exactly. Yeah. So I think what's going to be really important, you know, to sort of, um, you know, it's no secret that a lot of fans were disappointed in Batman v Superman. A lot of critics were disappointed in Batman v Superman. But one of the strongest points, aside from Ben Affleck's Batfleck, was Wonder Woman. And you know. People People are excited about this movie now, and I think that it's going to initiate goodwill for for the DC Cinematic Universe to see some really strong, positive, 
awesome Wonder Woman footage. How about you, Dennis? What's going to wow everybody this summer? Well, last year it was Deadpool. Deadpool is mm -hmm. the one that when they the, when they play that trailer in Hall H, everyone went nuts, and then they played it a second time. This year, I don't know. It's harder to tell because we don't know who's going. We already heard what Fox isn't going to be going to be there. Mm -hmm. We're not sure if Disney, Marvel going to be there. I mean, I would say okay, if Disney, and Marvel are going, I say Rogue One. I think Rogue One may be around the time when they will show another trailer. I mean, look, that's that's the goal because I'm going to be at Comic-Con. Yeah. But the week before, they're doing a huge presentation in London at Star Wars Celebration with Kathleen Kennedy and Gareth Edwards on stage. It's like a Rogue One panel. So you got to think that is going to be where, where they drop the new trailer. Now, we can all sit here and watch it, a collider, mm -hmm. and do a reaction and get excited. I just think that, you know, they did something pretty cool with Star Wars at Comic-Con last year. where They took everybody out and gave us a concert. They showed us a behind-the-scenes thing. I don't know that you're going to get that this summer, though. I think that if, if, if Disney and Marvel are there at all in Hall H, I think a Guardians of the Galaxy 2 teaser, something like that, because they they had footage from Guardians of the Galaxy that they showed when they had when they were shooting it for two weeks, the first movie, and they've already been shooting this movie for a little bit. So you got to think they're going to be able to cobble something together if they want to put anything out in Hall H. It's going to be live stream this year too. Now sometimes it depends on studio to studio, but they're going to show the entire panel that you can catch 24 hours later with the exception of the footage. So if the studio doesn't want the footage to get out, they're not going to show it. But if, if so, then everybody's going to get to watch it on the internet 24 hours after the actual panel. So stay tuned for more information. Obviously, we're going to be covering Comic-Con. We're going to have a huge presence down there. We're still sorting out all the details, but rest assured, you're going to see our sweaty faces down there in the hot, blazing San Diego sun. Okay, Ashley, now it is time to move on to Twitter questions. We gave the fans plenty of time to tweet in. What are some of the good ones they got for us today? So many great questions oh, today. Rob Carter. Tall writes, if you were stuck in a world where there was only one rating system, what would it be? For me, PG-13. Uh, so you only get like one rating of a movie? I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm i going to cheat here and I'm just going to go, I'm going to go NC-17 because that means you can put anything in there, right? Like you could have yeah. anything you wanted to in there. So you're never limited. You have no strings to hold you down. It's not because I'm a pervert. I mean, it's a little because I'm a pervert, <laughs> but it's also because like now you can make a PG movie. You know, you can get anything in a PG movie. You can get away with it in an NC-17 movie. But if you're, if you live in a PG-13 universe, there's stuff you only get like, like one F-bomb per movie. You only get like a quick shot of boobs or something like that i want maximum potential that's why i'm going nc-17 clark uh okay well <laughs> that was a good argument for nc-17 i'm gonna go r i'm gonna go r okay. for you know i i think that that's uh reasonable <laughs> everything nc-17 how about you dennis yeah you a g man I, no i'm gonna go rated r as well that's kind of where my head is at right now nobody's and, backing me up on the nc-17 no but i i I don't remember PG thirteen. I think they've strayed away from the the boobs in the in the PG thirteen movies. Now. There's a little boob in PG thirteen. No, movies now. they used to back in the day, but nowadays they've shied away from them. Now you can get away with more violence in PG thirteen movies, but less less nudity. Hmm. Somebody tweet Josh McCuga and ask him what was the last boob you saw in a PG thirteen movie? Because if anybody on earth knows the answer to that, it would be Josh McCuga. How about you, Ashley? What universe do you want to live in? You want to come over to the NC seventeen side? I was just trying to think of if. Spring Breakers was rated PG-13 because there were so many boobs It wasn't. In that Spring movie. Breakers was, was definitely God, R. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. Um, I would probably go with R. Just so you know, you have the... I don't, I don't want to go NC-17. I'm not like, Mark, you know, Mark, you're kind of a... Crossing the line there, but I think I'm when Ashley is telling you you're too dirty, yeah, you, you that dirty. is that is a thing. I'm not saying you have to put that <laughs> filth in there. I don't like seeing filth all the time. Okay, I'm just saying that you want the potential to do it if you feel like it. If that's how you want to express yourself. Long story short, Mark is addicted to porn. <laughs> uh, you guys are the studio, and you're holding me down, and I don't appreciate it because I'm an artist, damn it, and a little creepy. Okay, what's our next question? All right, Gerardo writes: Do petitions have any effect on a movie being seen? Been seen that a lot lately example petitioning for a certain story uh do petitions have an effect on a no. movie i mean it you know you, we like to think that in this culture of social media and everybody has a voice now that you can make a difference and i think a lot of times that people in high places do go to the fans they look at chat boards they look at tweets they look at you know all these things and they try to get a consensus but a specific petition like, for instance, when there was a petition going around to get Ben Affleck canned from playing Batman, you know, that didn't really work out too well. And I'm glad it didn't because Ben Affleck was awesome as Batman. Clark, can you ever think of a time when a petition that had, I guess, a lot of fan support 
actually made a dent in a film. Not not so much an actual petition, but I do agree with you that studios uh, and people who are making executive decisions do look at social media. And you know, if there is something that is a there's a major uproar or something like that, really upsetting a fan base, you know, a lot a lot of times uh, the the powers that be will listen, um, and sometimes they won't. But no, not an actual like I'm going to make a petition and get X amount of signers. I can't think of anything. How about you, Dennis? I don't think so. The, the, there's one going around now that's absolutely ridiculous. There's a petition to stop Marvel for paying for positive reviews. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or like, it, it's crazy and like have them stop paying oh. critics to bash Batman vs. Superman, which by the way, they took a thumbnail that we did for uh, Collider Mailbag one weekend where we dispelled that stupid conspiracy theory <laughs> and they used it for their own good, uh, for their own... Uh, <laughs> Uh, campaign. I, I thought that was ridiculous. I think we need to have a petition to stop the petition That's right. that is petitioning yes. against us getting money from Marvel and getting paid to bash Batman v Superman because none of that crap's true. But Never has been. You guys, you guys all watch Game of Thrones, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not a petition now, but there is a Kickstarter right now from a bunch of book readers for $20 million that wants to redo the Dorn storyline yeah, because they are not happy yeah. with the one with uh, on HBO. Well, when did they say it went wrong? Like at the beginning of season six? Like they just want to everything. There was a just big, the whole thing. There, there were a lot of people who were really disappointed in how the Sand Snakes were handled, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did. I think that that I haven't read the books myself, but I, I that's one of the less crazy. I mean, granted, I would not give anyone twenty, 20 million, million dollars to reshoot. for a Kickstarter. That's a little ridiculous, but I, I, I mean, it's like okay, we take your point, book readers. We, yeah. we get, we get it. I mean, maybe I'm just lazy. Like I don't even sign petitions. If somebody has like the, you know, they'll tweet like, oh, can you sign this petition? Even if I believe it, I'm like, nah, it takes too much work. I don't want to do the act. I do that. for environmental causes. You know not what? For pop I would do causes. for environmental causes, but I'm so sick of those people accosting me outside the movie theater. They have like the pink vest and they just come up to you and they act like they're not asking you to sign something it's like hey how's your day going i'm like no nah, i know hey those want. are better than the ones that are like you don't care about anything yeah. do you yeah they talk smack yeah. as yeah. you're leaving yeah like you you're a bad person because then they'll yell something like do you support baby deaths and you're like um <laughs> uh, obviously not then you have to go talk to them you don't have to actually you don't have to. <laughs> now when i walk around they're gonna say time. there goes nc17 else That's we're gonna right. let him walk okay what's our next twitter question marcus london writes since mother's day just passed my question is what was the first movie you saw with your mom Ooh, oh my great gosh. question. First movie I saw with my mom. I mean, obviously, like, they sat me in front of the TV when I was a kid, so I could watch, like, Wizard of Oz and Star Wars. But I have a vivid memory of my mom and I going on a mother-son date. We went to go see The Bodyguard. And because my mom was a huge Kevin Costner fan and she really liked Whitney Houston. And so we went to go see the bodyguard together. Like she needed somebody to go with her, or like, you know, couldn't find a babysitter or whatever. <laughs> How old so were you? I was I was young. Like I was too young to be seeing that movie because it's R rated, but it's not like too dirty. <laughs> Right? It's not NC-17. It's right? definitely not, not NC-17. Go crazy here. And The Bodyguard was a great movie, and I love my mom to death, and I'm glad we got to go see <laughs> The Bodyguard together. How about you, Dennis? Uh, my parents told me they took me to see Lady and the Tramp. That was the first Aww. movie that I saw when I was a kid, but I don't remember that, so I don't know. I think as a whole family, we went to go see Temple of Doom. Nice. nice. So. There you go. Start, that started the PG-13 revolution. Yeah, it did. How about you, Clark? Um, my mom didn't really take me to too many movies. It was more my dad who was taking me to movies. But as a family, I think they took me to see Dick Tracy in the theater. And I was talking to the people behind us about <laughs> Dick Tracy. I think I was like three. And I was like, did you know he has a yellow coat on? <laughs> and they were like, yeah. They are like, Clark, you, have, you can see color. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I that's, was little. That's pretty bad as for a three-year-old oh, to just yeah. be like that social. Oh, they and took us to, I, well, yeah, I'm a talker if our audience hasn't noticed. But, um, <laughs> and they also took us to like, I, I loved Batman. My mom loves Tim Burton. That's something. So she would take, she, she and my dad took me to Batman. Or they didn't take me to the theater to see Batman because I would have been three. They definitely took us to Batman Returns in theaters. Mm -hmm. Which was awesome. That That's why I like intense. scary movies. In case you guys are ever wondering why I like all the scary shit, it's because my parents took me to see <laughs> Batman Returns when I was five. <laughs> Ashley, uh, have you and your mom ever gone on a date to see a yes. movie? And I'm hoping this answer ends with an impression of your dad. Um, it might. I think he was there too. Um, <laughs> I think I've told this story before. I vividly remember going to see There's Something About Mary with my family. And I was That's way too so young good. to be there. And there was a scene where Cameron Diaz comes to the door and she, like, or I think 
she, he, he came to the door and then she had something on her ear or he had something on his ear and then she reached for it. She thought it was hair gel and I remember leaning over and asking my mom, <laughs> what that was? what is that? And she's like, I remember her saying, I'll tell you when you're older. And now that I'm older, I'm just like so embarrassed that I asked my mom, what is that? Have uh, you ever had that talk with your mom that she paid, you know, did she pay? No, thank the, goodness the, I went to a school that just, you know, they, 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 Gave me some sex ed, and I, I knew what it was thanks to school. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you sex school. ed, school. Thank we you, really Bella appreciate Vista. it. Okay, <laughs> let's do one more Twitter question. All right. Kyle Anderson writes, what horror movie could benefit the most from a remake with today's technology? Hmm, which horror movie out of all the classics that have ever been made could benefit from new technology. Clark, you are the horror expert. I will defer to you. You throw to me because you don't know your answer you yet. You are absolutely right <laughs> in that presumption. Oh man, well this is the thing is that I, I less about technology, wonder, uh, you know, or think about remakes and more just think about great ideas that could have, that, you know, with, with some uh, nurturing could could do something. Gosh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now too, in terms of technology. Yeah, I mean, cause so many times they do have the technology to do it, they just don't have have the story in place like mm -hmm. even like I get nervous because I saw I Frankenstein and I saw Dracula untold I am excited about this new mummy though like maybe that's yeah. the one that can start to stem the tide Dennis which horror movie do you think needs a an update with our technology well, today? you're asking the wrong person on this panel just say the darkness uh, yeah, the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, I think I've talked about this on the show before, but uh, the skeleton key with Kate Hudson came out a couple of like 10 years yeah. ago. Um, it's not great. However, I want to remake that movie big time. Great setting, great location, great premise, just not a great movie. I'm seeing a lot of the birds in the chat room and I'm seeing a lot of Hellraiser. Hey, Pinhead, we remember you. Oh. Come on back in the theater. I don't know that you need more technology. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think we need more technology for Hellraiser. I just think we need more. I, I mean, know. horror movies aren't like sci-fi movies or superhero movies where you need a lot of like visual effects. Plus, the the practical effects always work better. Yeah, are what are what sort of stand the test of time. Usually, um, that's what makes the Friday Thirteenth movies watchable, even though they're thirty years old to me, anyway. You know, I just went went to the twenty four hour or not twenty four hour um, all night movie marathon for. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street, Ooh, cool. and uh, yeah, and that was really, really fun. And you know, God bless them with such little budgets, they did incredible and and very ambitious things with all of those Freddy sequels. But that might be a good franchise. You know, let's forget about the reboot that they tried to do, the dark and gritty reboot. <laughs> but you know, actually getting into the hellscapes and the fantasy elements of night, that would be really cool to see a, a higher budget nightmare movie that really plays up on fantasy. All right, well, if you're a teenager, do not move on Elm Street anytime <laughs> soon. That is going to do it for today's episode of Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank everybody both behind the camera helping us out with the show today and everybody on the panel today. Dennis, let's start with you. Where can the kids find you? You can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to check out. We did our Game of Thrones review last night. That's on the channel right now. And uh, yeah, that's that's uh, we got a lot of other videos, right? We got the X-Men Days of Future Past commentary coming this week. Woohoo! That means we get to watch X-Men Days of Future Past. And that's always a good day at the office. How about you, Clark? Where can everybody find you? You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope at Clark Wolf. Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and on Facebook.com slash official Clark Wolf. Miss Ashley Mova, the statement necklace herself. Where can everybody find you? I'm not wearing a statement necklace. That's a pretty this powerful a statement necklace. statement necklace. Mark. Yeah. You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And we want to let you guys know that if you want to look for either Showtimes or Box Office Ticket information, just go to amctheaters.com. That's where we go. Go to collider.com if you want all the latest in the world of movie news. That's where we get a lot of the stories that we bring to you guys on the show each and every day. And of course, subscribe right here, Collider Video. You can check out my and Christian's YouTube channel, Schmoes No. My name is Mark, and you can find me online, all the social media channels, simply at Mark Ellis Live. That's all for today. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.